Now, when people find dementia, and many people do, this is the scenario that is usual about that. They have not really found their own path to their own non-physical because there have been so many physical stories that they've been believing and listening to instead. And so they haven't found that path into non-physical, but they're getting ready to make their transition. And so the physical world just becomes less and less acute to them, less and less specific to them, less and less precise to them. Without even it being at a conscious level, they begin defocusing the physical world in not their readiness for re merging in the non-physical because nobody needs to repair you, you could be bipping along at well we don't need to go into any graphic detail as you fall off a cliff or get run over by a truck but <laughs> So your re-emergence into non-physical, your personal re-emergence into non-physical, your grandparents' re-emergence into non-physical is simple and understood instantaneously. But that what dramatic humans want to call that long goodbye of dementia, that's for your benefit. That's to allow you a time of defocusing on that. That's a time for you to do something about your, and it's very common thing, dependency upon these people who have been strong and who have been a physical presence of stability and security that you've given your attention to this is something that we really want you to hear and it's the reason that we are all them too and us playing with you about the grandparents sort of thing so many people who have children are not stable in their world they're not stable in their relationship not really they're often newly married and they're insecure with their world and they bring you into the world under that state of insecurity and so most children most children do not have a stability to look for or to discover and so your adjustment is really understandable because they presented such stability most parents that's what they wish for this is the mantra of most parents we'll speak most parents mantra and then we will speak our recommendation for the parental mantra most parents mantra is I want to be so good at being a parent that my children can look to me and only to me for the well-being that they seek. And in my insecurity, because I've not yet really found my relationship with source energy, I will give it to them and they will give it to me. It's sort of a, we don't want to use a dysfunctional, but it certainly is a co-creation of you need me and I need you and you need me and I need you and you. They wouldn't put it into these words because they don't really understand non-physical and they don't really understand the term that we offer as inner being. But they're saying, I want to be everything that you will ever need and I want you to be able to look to me for guidance and stability. And that's what most parents wish for and it's what few parents accomplish your parents Esther's parents too sort of kind of accomplished that because they were stable in their world and so there was no upheaval in Esther's childhood there was a integrity and a philosophy and a well-being about life and so this is what we would wish parents to say instead I'm gonna be from earth standards a pretty flawed <laughs> I'm not going to be right in the middle of your world making every decision for you or even with you. I'm going to trust you to sort through contrast and build a big vibrational reality and then out of sheer desire to finally feel good because you're just not enjoying not feeling good you will find your relationship with your inner being and I will not stand in as a substitute for your inner being. That's what we'd like every parent to say and how that would play out most of the world would look at you and call you a sort of detached parent most people think that the more attention a parent gives the better it is for the kid and that's opposite what you're really wanting is for your children to look for love in all the right places to look for security in the right place to look for clarity in the place of connection with source energy because every single person Esther to a large extent found it in her parents it was what she would call a lovely childhood it took us a while to help her get over that and then she had a wonderful long time 30 something years with Jerry where he was like that for her in that he had lived more life he was older than she was he had lived a lot of life had a lot of stability so she looked to him for it and even though she had all this conversation with Abraham, it's easier to look in your physical crowds for your stability, but it's looking in the wrong places. And so we know for sure this thing, 
satisfaction oh, comes from one place and one place only and that's from desiring something and moving in the direction of your desire and usually it's a situation like this that causes you to look there and then find maybe for the first time in your life true personal satisfaction your parents do not have any regret about the angst that you felt for them through all those years they're not huddled together oh they're together but they're not huddled together in regret ah if we'd known then what we know now we'd have been terrible parents <laughs> If, if we'd known then what we know now we would have been so much less attentive we would have been less involved we'd have gotten dementia earlier <laughs> there's not any of that going on they're just thrilled with the vortex that you've built and thrilled with where they are in the whole scheme of thing and thrilled to be immersed in pure positive energy and thrilled at the keen insight that they have of everything that's happening here not just with you but with the world they love it is so thrilling to be newly refocused into non-physical and to realize your complete connection with what's happening here but feeling that from this compassionate sense that there's no sympathy there's no feeling of regret or lack when you cry out of sadness they don't cry with you in fact your sadness is your keenest indication that you're looking at them and all of that in a way that they are now not seeing it even when they were in their physical bodies they did not cry with you because they were getting ready to be dead <laughs> you see what we're getting at mm -hmm. Jerry and Esther, when they first moved to Texas, they found a little ranch house and there was a chicken coop and they got some chickens right away. They went to the feed store and chose the little chickens. Jerry chose them all and he chose what he thought were the brightest and the tallest and the healthiest. And he chose mostly roosters because he didn't know. He didn't know what was going on. <laughs> anyway, they loved their chickens and they had a few hens and a lot of roosters and they were watching them. And one day there was one hen, they named all the chickens. There was Big Bird, that was the primary big rooster he was an astrolorp black feathers and black feet and so gentle that he would sit in esther's lap and let her stroke him and the little hen henny penny would let her do that too and but they also had some different chickens that were from south america they were called ericanas and the ericanas were more wild and you couldn't catch them if you tried and bright beautiful feathers and they named the hen renegade because she would not stay in the hen yard. Every day she escaped. And Jerry said, she's such a renegade. And so they named her renegade. And one day, renegade was not only out of her hen yard, she was out of the whole acre that Jerry and Esther's house was sitting on and over in the neighbor's yard where the dog lives. And Esther called over the fence to renegade and said you're in dangerous territory over there renegade you need to come home and of course renegade just mocked her as she <laughs> just ran further and further and further and further and then Jerry was sitting at the desk and he got an impulse to go outside and he went outside and renegade was in the dog's mouth hanging like a limp rag and Jerry had a shotgun that he had never fired and he got the shotgun and he because he was not good at it he blew a big hole in the tree blew out the telephone line it was quite interesting to make a noise in the air and when the dog heard the shot he dropped the chicken and renegade shook off and came home And Esther and Jerry talked to us about that later that afternoon. And Jerry said, Abraham, I thought that chicken was dead. And we said, that chicken was getting ready to be dead. No point in hanging around for the kill. I'll just go now. <laughs> sort of like dementia. But then when it didn't come, oh, never mind. <laughs> This is an enlightening day, you've got to admit it.